On behalf of the advisory committee, thank you for making the facility available. Uh, and the advisory committee members are here. Thank you for your continued participation. Uh, we've invited two guests. We're, we're going we're to move this agenda around a little bit because we have a couple guests and have some time constraints, but I think it's important that we hear from them at this, at this juncture. So we've asked uh, our Franklin County Treasurer, and I think everybody knows if they don't. This is Ed Leonard. Uh, and, uh, he, the, and we also have John Turner from the city. Uh, there are two land bank uh, organizations that are, that are uh, taking place here in our community, or citywide, really, countywide, I guess, since, since uh, your involvement. And we wanted to kind of get some education about what that means, what, what's, what's the uh, mission of the land banks, Quite a few parcels of property in our geography uh, are held in land banks, and there is likely to be more uh, as, as, as we uh, travel it, looking out into the future over the next several years. So we thought it would be a good idea to get some sense of how property gets there, how it gets out of there, uh, and what uses it may be put to into the future. So I'd, I'd like to first start by again introducing Ed. And, and giving you the stage, and you can, I don't know, it, I'll stand, stand, stand up since. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the county treasurer, and one of the roles that's being afforded to county treasurers is to take on land banking opportunities. The, to, to get properties, typically properties that come into a land bank. A land bank is just a, uh, a company set up to hold properties. And, and in the county, we have the opportunity to set up a land bank. We've had one for a while, and it just really hadn't, didn't have much in the way of resources. And so now the new legislation that became effective last year allows us some more powers to allow us to do a little bit more, th uh, more things uh, to go after properties. One of the opportunities that it provides us with is to short circuit the sheriff sale when it comes to selling vacant and abandoned properties. Uh, what we find is that oftentimes when we take properties through the tax foreclosure process, and again, they have to be vacant and tax delinquent. And so when we take them through the tax foreclosure process and we take them all the way to what's required at the end of a, of a foreclosure action is to send it to sheriff's sale. What we find out is that properties get snapped up by folks who are looking to speculate on the property and may not necessarily have a, um, committed, a commitment to the community. And so what the, uh, the, the new power that we're provided for under the statute allows us to push properties through foreclosure, but then not have them go to sheriff's sale, so that they actually would just be transferred to the land bank, uh, the county land bank. And what I anticipate us doing is that if there, and what we do right now with the city's land bank is when we identify what properties are tax delinquent in the community, we provide that list to the city, and then they let us know, hey, we'd like you to pursue these properties in foreclosure. But oftentimes what they have to go after is the worst of the worst properties because they, uh, if, because most properties have to go to sheriff sale and not sell at sheriff sale to get them. Well, chances are the property that doesn't sell at sheriff sale is a pretty bad property. And so by being able to go after properties and short circuit that sheriff sale, we can actually get access to properties that might be in a little bit better shape, and but also be able to keep some of the speculators out and actually look at properties in, in the city has their process for how we, you know, how we dispose of them. And the county land bank would be developing that as well in terms of giving uh, members of the public the opportunity to, to purchase properties out of, out of the land bank. So, and then I also anticipate that we'd be working with our local nonprofit organizations, our local community development corporations to help facilitate uh, their getting properties. Because again, I don't see the county's land bank as being the entity that actually does redevelopment. I anticipate the county land bank would be the pro it would be the organization that gets the property but then gets it out into the hands of others to actually do the redevelopment. Uh, there may be some rehabilitation of properties that might they, the land bank might do, but I think that would be fairly limited. I think it's mostly working with those who are already in the community who are doing that type of work. Uh, there is a, and there's also additional revenue that's permitted under the under Ohio law to help fund this. 
And so that's why I think that we'll be working with, more with the city to help identify what properties we can help the city get control of, if there are resources that we can help devote in the city to helping demolish some of these really, really bad structures. And we look forward to doing that. And then we'll also be doing, since we are countywide, we'll be working with uh, some of our communities, suburban communities as well. And I, again, identifying properties that have some value and trying to get control of those uh, and, and put them back into productive use. And if they're really, really bad eyesores, if we, they need to be brought down, it's helping facilitate bringing those properties down and getting them into the hands of somebody who will actually re reutilize that, that, uh, that property. And then one of the other projects we've been working on over the last several years has been Point Dexter Tower, which is over, which is nearby. And what we've been working on that is to, to get control of the various units of that property. It ended up getting sold off into individual units, 101 separate units, and that property uh, ended up, again, we had 101 different owners, and it wasn't going to get redeveloped, nothing was going to happen to the property until we reconsolidated ownership into one entity, and that was the Central Ohio CIC, which is the county's land bank. And what we've, what we've done is over the, the course of the last several years is going through foreclosure process and getting, getting control of all of those 101 different ownership interests to the point now that we actually have control. We have been working with the city on that. We've got control of the property and we've got an order from the court to bring it down and now we're working on the funding to actually make that happen. Uh, we've, it, one of the biggest issues is it's got a lot of asbestos in it. So that's a big hurdle that we'll have to work on. But again, we've got you know, ownership of the property, which is a huge hurdle, but it's taken us many years to get there. We can look forward to continuing to move that project forward because we know it'll have a positive impact on the community if we get that property down. So, but, uh, so that gives you a little bit about that one particular property in Poindexter. and tells you a little bit more about what we're thinking of in terms of the land bank. And again, we always anticipate that this land bank concept most of the, the, the suggestions about properties will, we will entertain lots of suggestions from the community when they see properties that are in need of uh, being brought down. And it may not be every property, but if we can look at as many as we can uh, to, uh, again, make as big an impact as we can with the limited resources that we have. Thank you. Uh, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about the cities? Uh, sure. Um, again, my name is John Turner, and I'm uh, the administrator of the Land Redevelopment Office. We run the city's land bank. Uh, kind of just a brief uh, distinction between our, our two land banks. Uh, we have been in existence since about I think 1994. Uh, the, the, the land bank that Ed is uh, creating is uh, something that has just uh, been allowed under the Ohio Revised Code and it will be a nonprofit organization while we are in office within the city. Uh, my boss is sitting right here, uh, Boyce Safford. Uh, we are a, a, an office within the Department of Development. Uh, so <coughs> we work pretty closely with our other uh, offices within, the, within our department, including the Housing Division, Code Enforcement, Economic Development, and Planning Division. Um, we, uh, we all, all land banks kind of follow one kind of basic model. Uh, they acquire property, they hold property, and then they dispose of property. I think land banks are a very effective tool in addressing blighted property, uh, basically because you know there, there's a pretty big correlation between an abandoned property and a property that is tax delinquent. They usually go from their hand together. And when you use tax foreclosure as a way to address those, pro those properties, it is an effective tool because you're, you're basically giving that owner a choice. They can either pay off the taxes for the property that they have abandoned, or they let it go to another ownership. Now, all of our properties go through t uh, tax foreclosure, with the, which is a, a judicial foreclosure, and ends up at the sheriff sale, where it's offered to, uh, to bid for no less than two sales uh, to the public at large. And uh, right now, Approximately, I, I would guess about 80 to 90 percent of the properties that we sent in through this process ends up in our ownership. Uh, we're able to request these tax foreclosures with the, the understanding that if they don't sell at share sale, we get them and we have to resolve the, the, the issue from, from there on. So we've, we've been in um, a business for a long time, since 1994. Um, I have some stats together on where we are right now. Our current inventory uh, citywide is approximately 900 parcels, which how much we own in, throughout the city. 
About 60% of those we've received through tax foreclosure. Um, we, we've also uh, acquired properties through something called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Uh, we also receive properties that are donated to us. And we also uh, pursue properties or manage properties for city projects that are, are kind of outside the land bank technically. But we, uh, we maintain them and, and uh, work with other city departments to <coughs> revitalize areas. Uh, about 31% of those have structures on them. Now, some of those are, are still in the process of demolition. I'll get more into the demolition in a minute. Um, but most of what's in our inventory are vacant lots. And most of what's in our, in it, our inventory in this area are vacant lots. Um, sales, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we, we've, we've had the, the, the benefit of an uh, influx of federal funds. Uh, those federal funds for the land bank have, have really uh, ramped up our demolition of properties. Uh, we've been aggressive in pursuing a lot of lighter properties throughout the city. Um, and we've used federal funds to demolish them. Uh, we've also worked with all of our nonprofit groups in trying to acquire properties for projects that they are uh, trying to uh, uh, put together. A good example in this area is the Novo pro uh, project on the uh, uh, north 20th, 21st, uh, north of Long. In that area, I think we own about 20 parcels that we are basically holding for CHP uh, to get uh, to, to develop as they sell their, their existing houses that they are developing. Most of the properties that they are developing in that area, I, I think, are tend to be the land bank properties. It's a mix of things that they've acquired and things that we've acquired. Um, so, you know, this federal money is, is given us the opportunity to, 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 to acquire a lot of properties and also to sell a lot of properties. In 2010, for example, we sold a, a total of 128 parcels. Uh, those parcels went uh, to, to the following. Uh, 46 went to, uh, were, are being redeveloped as single family new builds. Uh, two are multifamily new builds. 62 are single family rehabs. Uh, six are multi-family rehabs, and we sold 12 side yards to the adjacent property owner. About of the 128, about 100 of those went to nonprofit. The rest went to for-profit, um, including uh, people who want to buy a house and renovate it for for, the, for them to live in, uh, to investors, and to uh, side uh, adjacent property owners. Uh, for 2011, uh, as of October, the, these stats are a little old. Uh, we've sold a, a total of 57 properties. About 37 of them went to nonprofits, including uh, 26 for single family houses, uh, one multi family new build, uh, 12 uh, single family rehabs, and four uh, multi family rehabs, and 15 side yards. So basically, in a given year, um, the last couple of years, most of our structures have gone into for projects for rehab. Uh, but we also have a lot of uh, new builds. Acquisitions, uh, this year we've acquired a total of 181 parcels citywide. 92 of them, 92% of them are tax foreclosures. <coughs> the rest are donations, basically. And we, we refer to donations as uh, future tax foreclosures. We either accept the donation, figure out a way to accept the donation, or we get it. Uh, in 2010, we acquired a total of 250 uh, parcels, about half of those were tax foreclosures. Uh, the rest were <coughs> predominantly MSP acquisition and donations and et cetera. Demolitions, uh, we, we received funds in both MSP 1 and MSP 2 and have, have uh, demolished a total of about 135 structures since spring of 2010, that's when we started this. Uh, we have about 60 more that are in the pipeline right now waiting to be uh, demolished. Um, and, uh, and as I said, we, we do own properties in this area. I have some uh, information on, on a couple of the properties that we own, um, but uh, just, just a quick look at our inventory. We own about 13 parcels uh, to the east of Taylor Avenue, either on Taylor Avenue or to the east and about uh, 15 from Taylor Avenue to the west to Champion. Um, and as I said, uh, all except maybe four or five of those are, are lots. Um, and I have more information.
information if anybody's interested. Uh, to acquire property from us, uh, we require an application. Uh, those applications are available online on our website. Uh, we look at two main things. Uh, one, uh, we, we, we require you to, to um, tell us what you plan to do with the property, uh, how much you, want, you intend to spend on the property, what improvements that, that you uh, propose to make, um, whether or not you have the funds to do those improvements, um, whether or not you have experience or have someone who's working with you that has that experience. Um, whether or not you have a history of uh, foreclosure, tax foreclosures, or code violations. Um, and you know, for Near East, we send that applicant to the Near East Area Commission to get their input on, on, the, on the project. Uh, we also uh, lease uh, community gardens. Uh, most, I, I would say most community gardens that, that, are, that exist throughout the city are on land bank properties. Um, and we lease those for ten dollars a year, um, and uh, that's an ongoing pro program. In a given year, we probably have about anywhere from thirty to forty parcels that are used as community gardens. And uh, we also sell uh, a, a vacant property uh, to the adjacent property owner to use as their side yard. All of our properties we have we are required by the, the, the state statute to sell it for fair market value. Uh, we have a saying in our office, uh, the more money you propose to invest in the property, uh, I think it's reasonable to assume the fair market value may be a little less than what's, what's on the, the price on our website. Uh, we look at that on a case by case basis. So, if there's any questions, I can certainly answer. Uh, I want to thank both of you, and I'm going to open up some questions for the, for the um, advisory committee, and if we have time, then here. Uh, this this session is 6:30, but I, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, and Lila and, and her committee is going to certainly be looking uh, more closely at this. The, the real issue is when we go out and fix up a property, or a developer or owner goes out and fix up a property, and right next door, a property is boarded up, abandoned. Uh, we know the issues. Uh, it doesn't help property values. It really doesn't even uh, give the, the, the developer, in that instance, uh, a return for what it is that they're trying to achieve. So the idea is that sometimes some of these blighted properties that aren't uh, suitable for rehabilitation, if they're removed or taken out, taken <coughs> down, it might add value to the neighborhood as opposed to uh, sitting there as a, as a blighted condition. So this is going to be, this, you know, we have, we've talked about it, we know that, that there are areas in the city where we're, we have these types of concerns. The land bank may become a, a vehicle uh, for addressing some of these issues. I think, I think honestly, the land bank uh, challenge is where do they get money to demolish these properties? Yeah. There's probably more properties where they, they need demolition than there is money identified in order to do it. But uh, this, is, we'll come back to it. Leela, we, I'm sure you and your committee will have to We'll, we'll be dissecting this issue, and uh, we'll see where that, that, that takes us as we go along. So first of all, any questions from the advisory committee? Willis? Yeah, I think that uh, that we should establish with the, in, within the city a process of deconstruction of, the, of our existing home. We have 100-year homes. If you're talking about demolishing and pushing everything into the ground, it's not necessary. And that in itself can be a, a revenue-generating Avenue also for training for some of our youth, you know, and, and I, 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 I'm proposing that that becomes we we we, we ask the city to to have legislation for that that 80 year old 100 year old home in a frame or whatever it is it has molding that you cannot buy today it has all these things that you can then establish and train some of our youth in some type of employment to deconstruct these houses and recycle that material that you can't get anymore. Because what we feel in Bronzeville, which, you know, we, where most of uh, um, a lot of the, the houses that, I, uh, that you have need to be recycled, and we have several that are coming up shortly that we want to have recycled. So I think that's the way. Again, because people will, will pay for that proper that that hundred year old molding, and um, I think we should consider that and let that be um, part of the package of the community recycling and creating jobs and employment and training for the, 
the, the community. Let me ask you, so I'll be clear. When you say deconstruction, right. you mean tear down the house, mm -hmm. but some of the most important things, keep and then set up a location somewhere to resale right. to someone? Right. Okay. All certain homes, not every but home. You, it, you, you have people that can go in and assess the home. And, and and then see what is available, what what can be saved, what can be recycled. We, we, we can talk to certain groups about right. that concept, but no, we really haven't found anybody that has that capacity to, to really execute it on a on a you know group large on scale. On a large scale. Yeah. Uh, there is a requirement to recycle building components yeah. such and as you know wood, concrete, you know, etc. And, and you know, just to be clear, we, we, we don't take the house and just put it in the hole that where the basement was. It, as part of our specifications, we, we take out the right. entire foundation on the uh, basement walls. And, and to answer you, you make some recommendations that we have a, a number of very good um, contractors in the community that can specialize, they can diversify. So you don't have to run and train, you can just put that out there and bring them in and say, this is where we're going, how can we include you? And that's a, another source of revenue for them because they get cut out of all the big projects in, in the city, the major ones, because they're not big enough. So this is one way they can specialize and still be able to economically uh, compete. Okay, I see there's some questions in the audience, but I first want to get around to the advisory committee members. Is there any other questions that's coming? And, and th that's a suggestion that certainly we need mm -hmm. to think about. Uh, now, I don't know how many houses will end up being demolished or rehabbed or, I mean, that's, somebody's got to come in with money to do those kind of things, but I think we can make available, I should consider making available uh, opportunities to preserve some of the history uh, of, of the community. And I think that's a good suggestion. For the housing community, if I could get both your cards and be in touch with you about needing to talk about some possible strategies. Are there any other questions first from the advisory committee? If not, there's a hand. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Barry Edney. Um, I moved to uh, Hampton, Virginia uh, about a year ago. And I wa always was concerned about my neighborhood because I owned a business in the Mount Vernon Plaza for almost like 15 years. And um, also, you know, lived in the neighborhood. I used to own a house at uh, Pierce Estates. And, um, my concern is that, well, for one, I don't see too many people in my neighborhood here, and that's a major concern. I look on this paper and I see a lot of advisory committees and people that I know in this community, um, Willis, uh, Leela, and a few other people. But my concern is that I don't see my community represented as a whole here. Is there a problem? Hampton, Virginia. Yeah. No, I'm, no, I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about here. I'm talking about here. I still, my heart is still here. And what I see happening here is that we always left out, and I want to talk about this because I-670 is one thing that happened years ago that we were guaranteed that it was going to create jobs for people in the neighborhood and, and people would be able to get jobs. See the same thing, tax abatements, whether it's going to OSU or other groups that's getting these tax abatements. That's a question. Yeah. We have yeah. limited time yeah. for these yeah. gentlemen. Yeah, well, I want to question. answer that. I want there to, are questions okay. for okay. these gentlemen. Okay, yes, yes, because the treasurer okay. and the guy that works for the city. Because, you know, you're taking people's property, okay? I want to know from the uh, Franklin County uh, um, what is it, tax uh, treasurer. treasurer, I want to know, and especially since in these hard times people are struggling, people lost jobs and people going through hard times, you know, is there a break so that they won't get their houses taken? And then, you know, these banks have got so much money, is there a way that they can, you know, probably take the house and rent it back to the same people so they don't have to move out and they can okay, I think this is back. a different question, right? Because the properties we're talking about are people who have abandoned, not paid taxes. Yes, okay. And not that's cared what, for. Well, so that's a, we, we that's a, Mr. But, Mr. Reddick, I'm asking a question. I understand, but I want to keep okay. this to the land bank issue. Okay, can I take this straight to the land bank? Let me make okay. it direct so you understand what I'm saying. As Mr. Rantzeri said, is that the, the when it comes to land bank properties, we are dealing with properties that are tax delinquent and they are vacant and abandoned. That's so why I'm, that's why I'm asking you questions. So what happens to people that that's probably well, in, in the midst of getting this taken? Well, what we do is we work with folks who are if, if, if a homeowner every homeowner is entitled by law to at least one payment plan okay. uh, on their program. We try we stretch the payments out for as long as we can to make it as cost effective for them 
to, to manage that tax obligation before we initiate ha have to initiate foreclosure. And oftentimes, if we initiate a foreclosure on a tax delinquent property uh, and somebody's living there, we've given them multiple opportunities to to pay the t to get into payment plans to pay the taxes. So we we really do try and work. Other with than the orders. payment plan, if they lose their job, is there where they get extension because they out of work? to hold up their taxes so they probably won't be taken, the city won't take them, y'all won't take them. See, these are important questions, Barry, but these are not really within the realm of the of what we're trying to do as an organization. Okay, but I just we're, heard what you said okay. about taxes. He introduced himself, I heard what he said, okay. and that's why I asked those questions. Right? Very good questions, but I think this is a different organization, and we have a different, a slightly different mission. Yeah, but when you okay. have a, There's another question from the, uh, uh, I mean, I want, I want to yeah. give people an opportunity. But when you have him represent himself, and he said what he said now, okay. I'm going by what he said, and I wanted those answers. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to bail out people that are old. Well, uh, by Wall Street, that's, I think, their economy. The, if, if you'd like to speak not, about no, no, no. mortgage relief, I guess there there are there are places within the county in which that can be exactly. dealt with. You can call his office. Exactly. And we do have programs. This is a, what we're talking about is something a little different. But there was another hand up. Okay, please. Yeah, um, I'm friend of Johnny. I'm uh, I'm interested in this for a number of reasons. I'm a faculty member at Ohio State. I have a house in Columbus. There's a number of reasons why I'm interested in this. Part of the Occupy movement as well. Um, I guess some of what some of what just happened in the discussion actually was real, really useful. I want to thank Larry for for your comment because Barry, um, Barry. Barry I'm sorry, yes, sir. Um, but we just met. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it was, it was really important because what was what I felt was missing a little bit from the presentations was um, an explanation as to what kind of properties are these. You know, because when we talk about Poindexter Tower. You know, and the asbestos and stuff like that. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, either people are living there, no, or they, they were, there, they were, or time. they were living there recently. No, no. no. it's been years. No. Okay, so you years. Ju you're just talking about, you know, it, it, it would help when so many. I think you'll admit that a lot of new people are in the room. So I just just trying to get a sense of like, you know, what exact, how exactly does this relate to the mission of PACT? And I guess what you're saying is this is particularly about properties that are abandoned. And well, this, this was, was illustrative. I think when you talked about Poindexter, that was kind of towers. The tower, it had more to do with what happens in a, in a land bank acquisition. But we do have a lot of properties in our geography that have been abandoned. Grass isn't getting cut, snow isn't getting shoveled, taxes aren't getting paid, and, and, and they're not being boarded up. The, the owners of the property sometimes aren't even residents of Ohio. So yes. they, they bought them in blocks. And this is all, it, it, it all kind of evolves out of the mortgage crisis, and you're right about that. Well, and yeah. the question is, how do, we, how do we take better control of the property so we can move forward? And our, our, our mission is to revitalize the community. And, and I, I'd add, you know, the, the typical property that we acquire, you know, typically <coughs> they're a referral from code enforcement that hadn't been resolved because of uh, outstanding code issues. By the time we receive the property, on average, I would uh, guess that it has been vacant for at least five years. Mm -hmm. uh, the interior has been stripped. Um, the, most of the time, the, the building is wide open unless uh, our code enforcement office has, has secured it. Um, the, the, the city's mowing the grass. So these are properties that <coughs> the previous owner has abandoned. We also, uh, you know, we, we also work with you know, very closely with our city attorney's office on, you know, an, another example of a lot of properties that we are, we uh, pursue are properties owned by deceased individuals whose estate was not uh, taken care of. And so we, there's no there's no entity or an LLC that is defunct and nobody knows what happened to it. Okay, we promised 6:30. There's one other question that was, oh well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm going to first. Uh, get our advisory committee question in. I think what I hear him asking is what does this discussion have to do with PAC? Right. This discussion is a component of it. This is the housing piece and there are lots of <coughs> ideas that have been formulated, thought about. This is one component that has been talked about in the subcommittees. And so these gentlemen are here giving information. This is the chair of that committee. And so this information will be brought back, talked about, how can we incorporate this into the larger plan? There's another, uh, I'm sorry. One direct question about, 
you said um, some were given to uh, for-profit organizations and some to non-profit. Um, is there an attempt to give them give more to non-profit and um, you know, is there a way that that can be turned into more housing for people who, we, we, we you know, actually, who've been losing their houses? We actually will, we, you know, in, in, in our, our main project areas, we will go ahead of the, the nonprofit, let's say they're concentrated on one street, we'll actually look at the, the adjacent streets. Because keep, keep in mind, to get a property from tax foreclosure, it takes a long time. It takes a year and a half to, to, to two years from the time that we request the, the foreclosure action to the time that we get title, and that's two years where nobody's taken care of it. And um, but but that so we try to project where our community development corporations are going to focus and try to be ahead of them and to, to get properties that they can work on when they sell what they're working on. And there was a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Tom here. I'm a musician here. Uh, and a former resident of Pontiac Village. My question is, uh, uh, is the whole plan is this to demolish the, the entire Pontiac Village, or is that, is that your plan? I don't well, know. No, no, well, that, the land bank is something different. I think we're going to talk a little bit in the, in, in the later in the meeting about Poindexter specifically. Uh -huh. But the land bank issue is Poindexter Village will not end up in the land bank, hopefully. Poindexter Tower. Tower. Tower has currently been we've been accumulating the, the individual units of Poindexter Tower over the last several years. The Poindexter Village is a. We, we hope that's not. We're not going to be talking about land banking. Poindexter. Okay, so my main, you know, one of my concerns is, is the history of uh, Poindexter Village itself. You know. We can talk about well, that. That's going to come uh, back up in the we'll agenda later. Later, later in the agenda. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I said last question, so this has to be last question. Go ahead. I just have a question about, is there a, 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 a piece of plan for the Near East Side as it relates to the, the use of the land bank? Has there been a, you know, are you all looking at some kind of strategy that is known only to you all, or is there a strategy in terms of how, this, how the land bank, what the intent of this land is in terms of home ownership or exactly what it is that you're well, in terms of the county land bank, I really anticipate that from the impact it has within the city is really in coordination with, you know, that, that the county land bank would facilitate acquisition of, of properties that the city is really requesting. If we can do anything to speed that up or help in terms of the demolition costs of properties, <coughs> but in terms of the strategy as to redevelopment of it, we would look to the city to really take the, role, the lead in that as, as the city of Columbus. And, you know, I, I'd say, you know, I... I, I like that this this group is, is getting together to focus on this area and, and give us some advice on how to pursue vacant abandoned properties. Um, you know, I, I think we, we, we kind of have, a, in general, kind of a, a, a dual strategy. On one hand, we, we do work with neighborhood-based predominantly CDCs trying to focus on certain areas in town and trying to get the, the, the properties acquired for those projects. And then we also kind of on a kind of a shotgun approach or, or kind of a much wider, broader way trying to address, address vacant properties. But to be frank, there are so many more vacant properties out there than we can even deal with right now. And, um, you know, any advice that we can to, 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 to focus in on certain areas, we, we certainly will be. And you'll be hearing from us. <laughs> I can assure you that. And I think it'll be a strategy that incorporates a lot of different elements of it in terms of community, the community development corporations, essentially faith-based uh, organizations. I mean, just a variety of, of organizations to help uh, address different properties and different situations. So. Tim, I'll be reporting on that later on. Housing has begun to work on that. And my request to meet with both uh, the City Land Bank and the County Land Bank is a part of that process, okay? So I would like to thank these gentlemen for taking the time to come. <coughs> uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that, uh, you'll be, that you'll be hearing uh, uh, from us quite a bit as we move forward. this thing forward. Look forward. <laughs> opportunities, and hopefully yes, we are able be. to help with some opportunities for this community. Uh, so, but thank you and, and uh, very informative. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
get their questions ans answered because you're going to be we're not going to see come together again for several months and, and our work is going to be continuing so that's going to be the first if we have additional time I would love to get the audience's input as well so that will be the ground rules and we're going to try to stick as close as we can to the time limit. because we have so many guests here I just like to go around the room real quickly and have us introduce who we are and the organization from which we come uh, to the people that are here, because uh, I, I, there are faces I have not seen in prior meetings. So I'll start. I'm Fred Rancier. I'm a 36-year resident of this community, so I think I know a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, and I'm a lawyer, and uh, I uh, stand before you trying to run these meetings. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Brian Brown, and I'm with the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority. Good evening, I'm Lula Boykin, I co-chair the Housing Subcommittee, and I'm a 30-year resident of this community. I'm Jerry Friedman, I'm with the Ohio State University Medical Center. Um, good evening, my name is Dominique Jones, and I'm with the United Way of Central Ohio. <coughs> I'm Barbara Cunningham, I moved from Pine Lake to Village. I was there from 75 until 211. <laughs> 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 Good evening, everybody. My name is Curtis Williams. I work with Franklin County Economic Development and Planning. Good evening. My name is Shannon Harden. I'm with the City of Columbus. Good evening. I'm Carl Williams. I work with Council Member Priscilla Tyson, Columbus City Council. Good evening. I'm Willis Brown, and I'm president of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association and a 25-plus year resident, current resident of the Bronzeville Neighborhood, which the point that sits in the middle of. Autumn Williams. I'm the program manager for PACT. Tim Anderson. Uh, I've been in the neighborhood, lived in the neighborhood since 1983. I attended St. Dominic's back in the late 60s um, and have been, like I said, a, a resident, permanent resident here since 1983. Kim Jordan, executive director of the, this particular YMCA. Um, my grandparents and my parents uh, grew up in Eastgate and uh, still own the home there. Elizabeth Seely, I'm the Executive Director at University Hospital East. I am Pastor Cindy Averse, uh, serving Bethany Presbyterian Church, which is right behind the King Octagon Mess, uh, and I'm here representing the Eastside Fellowship Ministry. <coughs> I'm Carol Volchewski, and I'm in charge of the school construction program at Columbus City Schools. Boy Seven the Third, Development Director for the City of Columbus. Good evening, I'm Dawn Tyler Lee, Executive Director of PAC, and I grew up here on the Near East Side. I'm just going to run off the names of those who have not who are not here in attendance. Uh, everyone around this room is an ambassador, and information will be flowing through them to you. Hopefully, if things are working the correct, the correctly. So, uh, I want you to know. Uh, I want you to know who to contact when you have your questions. Eric Janis is uh, with Franklin County. Uh, Annie Ross Womack, as you know, Long Street Business Association. Pastor Henry Johnson, Union Grove. Patricia Mullins, Isabel Ridgeway, and Council Member, well, represented here today, Council Member uh, Priscilla Tyson. So th th they make up the advisory committee, and, it, and we are reaching, they will reach out to you to make sure that information is conveyed. If you have questions, please contact them. Uh, we start all of our meetings with, our, with a question. What's our, what's our objective here today? And given the presentations that we've had, the check-in question for the advisory committee is, what is the one thing you think we can or should do to address vacant and abandoned properties within the fact geography? And that's really our focus. I mean, that's, it's, it's important. Uh, I, in the interest of time, and I do want to get some input from people over in this room, I'm just going to, let's just jump right to the executive director report, and, and then we'll fill in as we go through it. Okay, go ahead. So thank you, Chairman Sear. Again, my name is Dawn Tyler Lee, and I'm the Executive Director of PAC. Just by way of background for all of our guests who are here this evening, first of all, we welcome you. We're glad to see so many people excited about this work here on the Near East Side. I do want to make sure we capture all of your contact information so we can continue to keep you informed about this process and continue to have you engaged in this work. So if you did not sign in um, on the sign-in sheet on the table out in the hallway, please make sure you do so so that we can, can, can continue to keep you updated and gauge your input and feedback as we move through this process. 
Um, I do have uh, an executive director's report that I'd like to walk through for the members of our advisory committee <coughs> and for our guests. My apologies for not having enough copies for our guests. Again, you leave your contact information. We'll be sure to get that information out to you following this meeting. For those of you that do have the executive director's report, what I'd like to do is start with the last page, and I think it will be helpful to lay the foundation for the professor who expressed interest in wanting to get a better understanding of our work. We uh, were formed about a year ago. There was a uh, press conference in the lobby of University Hospital East in November of 2010, and PACT is a partnership of the city, the university, the housing authority, and Near East Side stakeholders. And through PAC, we define stakeholders as people who live, work, worship, <coughs> visit, and appreciate the Near East Side. So we are very broadly defining stakeholders because we want people to be engaged and feel connected to this work. What we ultimately are seeking to do through PAC is to create a blueprint for community investment for this neighborhood. The university has committed to invest up to $10 million in this neighborhood, and that investment commitment will be determined through our blueprint for community investment or our master plan. We did release an RFP in November, and the responses are expected back in our office by December, and there is a subset of this advisory committee that Chair Rancier will talk about, about a little bit more that has been identified to help serve as the selection committee for our master planner. We anticipate that the master planning work that will occur will help to shape how our $10 million investment will be made. So the partners, the city, the university, and the housing authority have committed to invest in this neighborhood, and we want to do that in collaboration with the community. So through this tax process, we've divided our work into five areas. Jobs and economic impact, safe neighborhoods, health and wellness, education, and housing. Across those five subcommittees, stakeholders have been engaged since earlier this year, really looking at what the needs and opportunities are here in this community. So we have chairs of those subcommittees around this table as our advisory committee members, and across all of the subcommittees, we have about 100 stakeholders who have expressed interest in being involved in this work. We have asked our subcommittees to help make recommendations that will be considered for inclusion in the master plan, and that work really is just beginning. Our subcommittees after the new year will really look at what kinds of opportunities there are through this process to help even further enhance the Near East Side. And so we encourage those who might be interested in learning more about this work to connect with our subcommittee process. So that is just a very high level overview. I can certainly um, answer more questions following our meeting about our overall process and how we intend to get there. But because we have so many guests, I just wanted to make sure that we were all uh, understanding what the goals of the project are. If you will look at the last page that's entitled Year in Review, I'll just quickly highlight some of our achievements. As I mentioned, we were formed about a year ago and we've been laying the groundwork for the planning process which will officially launch in January. So we PACT have established an office on the Near East Side. We have an office on Taylor Avenue. We have also um, involved people throughout the community in community conversations and these are small group conversations that were intentionally small so that people could feel comfortable sharing their thoughts and ideas about um, the neighborhood and what they'd like to see for the future. In just a moment, I'll turn the floor over to our program manager, Autumn, who will give you just a taste of some of the feedback that we received during the community conversations. Those conversations were facilitated by uh, stakeholders throughout the community who expressed an interest in being involved. As I mentioned, across our five subcommittees, we've engaged about 100 stakeholders in this work. This advisory committee has convened five times over the past year, and they're probably sick of getting updates and emails from me, but we certainly think it's important that the advisory committee stay informed of and connected to this work all throughout the process. 
there have been a number of groups that I have gone uh, before to talk to <coughs> about the PACT work, and they're listed on the um, bottom half of the year in review sheet. And if there are other groups who you think would like to learn more about this work, please let me know, and I'm happy to come and talk to them. We did, through the leadership of two of our advisory committee members, Brian Brown and Dominique Jones, uh, we were able to be a, a co-applicant in two federal grants totaling almost a million dollars um, that could potentially bring additional resources into the neighborhood if we're successful in getting those grants. And then we're really excited about our website that we launched just last month. And so I would encourage you to regularly visit our website so that you can get updates about our work. There is a section called the meeting room where you can go in and get our meeting minutes and any other information that is relevant to PAC so the community can stay informed. That web address is eastpact.org, eastpact.org. We will also be launching an official newsletter after the new year, and we also will have uh, weekly bloggers who will talk about their experiences here on the Near East Side, and we are creating a pool of video footage of stakeholders in the neighborhood that we'll post there as well. So please, advisory committee members and guests, do use the website as your source for information. As I just move my way backwards through the report, I will uh, leave the subcommittee updates for our committee co-chairs, uh, but I would like to acknowledge one of our advisory committee members who unfortunately for us, fortunately for her, is moving on to a new role. Dominique Jones from the United Way of Central Ohio will be going to New York City to be the uh, director of programs, the chief program officer for the New York City Food Bank, which is the largest food bank in the nation. She will oversee feeding programs and income programs and will have a really big role there at the Food Bank, and she has been a tremendous asset to PACT, to our education subcommittee, and we just wanted to take this opportunity to thank her for her involvement and for her leadership. So thank you, Dr. <laughs> United Way remains committed to this process, and we're working on identifying another advisory committee member who will represent United Way as part of this body and we're also working to identify uh, someone who certainly won't fill D Dominique's shoes because that's not possible, but will serve in a leadership capacity for the education subcommittee. So we will- It won't so leave after a year, right? It won't I'll leave after, after a year. year. <laughs> That'll be a criteria. We're gonna make a sign <laughs> So we will uh, certainly keep our advisory committee members informed of, of who that addition will be and um, who will serve in a leadership role for the education subcommittee. Just continuing to move backwards, um, I will provide just a quick overview of the RFP process. I did mention that it was released in November. We released the RFP to uh, about 75 local and national firms. Advisory committee members will recall that at our September meeting, we spent a pretty extensive amount of time hearing from you what you'd like to see included in the RFP and getting that feedback from you. A draft of the RFP was developed with the assistance of the Department of Development Planning Division and that RFP was released in November. Responses will be due back in November, as I mentioned. December. I'm sorry, December. December 15th is the due date. We will be uh, selecting a, um, a firm by the end of January so that they can get on board and really start with the planning work. And we anticipate, we expect uh, that the planning, uh, that the RFP, that the master plan will do will be with extensive community engagement. So I talked about the first round of community conversations that occurred for all of our guests that are here. We anticipate having a second phase of community conversations that will be facilitated and led by our co-chairs and so for those of you who have very specific ideas about what you'd like to see in this neighborhood we invite you to those conversations so you can share that input and that feedback I think that is everything I wanted to cover the, oh, the other item that I'd like to uh, mention is that on January 8th we are hosting what we're calling the launch and that is the official launch into our planning process. It will be a community-wide celebration 
conversations earlier this year. Let me first just give you a warning. I have a sinus infection, so I can't really hear myself. So <laughs> if you can't hear me or you need me to repeat something, just raise your hand and shout at me. So we did phase one of the community conversations. Um, we began in July and fortunately and unfortunately, we're still going. Um, unfortunately for me, because it's a lot of data to keep compiling, uh, but fortunate because we're still getting good information. So um, on your handout on the front part, I kind of gave you a brief overview of the design. Um, <coughs> the goals of the conversations were to identify major themes, ideas, and surface beliefs about the community from our stakeholders. Um, as Dawn mentioned, they were in the form of small groups or what we call kitchen table style conversations. And those groups were intentionally small so that we would have a meaningful conversation um, and not a bunch of people and not able to really capture what was happening. So that was the design. Uh, we trained more than 30 people to facilitate, scribe, and observe those conversations. And that was, again, so that we could capture the information. Um, the conversations uh, were born out of the all five of the subcommittees saying in June that they wanted to hear from the community more. And so together, we came up with the concept of doing community conversations. Um, phase two will build on the initial feedback that we got from the community and we'll seek some response to some specific ideas. So phase two won't be the same list of questions or the same concept. We won't be looking for service beliefs because we've already gathered those. But some of the subcommittees have ideas that they want to get the community's reaction to and gather some input on those. So we'll look forward to planning for phase two in early 2012. Um, the way that we did our outreach was primarily word of mouth, flyers, and emails. Um, and if anybody has any feedback on other outreach tools that we could use, we are more than um, happy to hear those. Um, the subcommittees will use the feedback from the community conversation and other outreach methods to inform their recommendations for the blueprint. Um, and we held the community conversations at locations throughout 43203. Um, and some of those locations are listed on the handout. Um, and again, the community conversations are only one way that we're seeking community input. Um, so. You have a preview of the results on the back of your um, handout. We engaged over 300 stakeholders. It was about 317 people and about 26 community conversations. Um, that is a very exciting for us because we didn't know what to expect, but it still is only a drop in the bucket. And so we're looking to reach out even further. Um, so on the back, what I did was I took some of the words of the responses that we got from the very first community conversation, which was, what kind of community do you want? And so I took all of these words, and these came out from those 
from the people that answered that question. And so the bigger the word, the more times it occurred. Um, and so you can see that community came out a lot. That word came out in the conversation about 45 times. So when we asked people, what kind of community do, th do you want? A lot of them said, I just want a community. And we got to the definition of what is a community. A lot of people were interested in accessibility and grocery and people, diversity, uh, relationships, transportation, education, et cetera, et cetera. So as Dawn said, this is really just a preview of the data. This word cloud represents 14 pages of text. And this is only one of the questions. So at the launch on January 8th, we will have um, more kind of displays of all of the conversations. We'll do a PowerPoint presentation where we'll explain what we heard under the specific topic areas um, because the conversations were held under the five core areas that PACT is focusing on. So jobs and economic impact, education, health and wellness, housing, safe, vibrant, and industrial <coughs> neighborhoods. But I really just wanted to give you guys a taste of Many of you, when I walked in, said, where have you been? I've been in this word cloud. Um, and there are many more to come. So advisory committee members, I hope that this is a good brief overview for you. And I hope that this gets you excited, because the people really are talking, um, and we're really listening. So questions? We're going to start again with the advisory committee. Willis? Yeah, I, I have two questions. One concerning <laughs> the RFP process that it, it, it's awful. The, the subcommittees that we have all come back. Lila's going to give a presentation to the body. The last meeting we had on, on, in September, we had a discussion on what should be in the RFP. I asked specifically, because a lot, some of the members were not there, the advisory board was not there. I said, are we going to come together as a body to discuss what we are saying that has to go into the RFP? and then vote on that. I mean, that's what we are here for. We would say, oh yes, we're gonna come together as a, as a body and discuss these things and then let it go out. Because what we found in the RFP, it was sent out in November. We had not convened, yes, I received an email saying, well, if you have the time or it's available at my office, we are all professionals. Why should we have to take our time to go to your office and review the RFP process when one, it should have been sent out to us, two, uh, and if, if you want to meet your deadline of November 15th, you should have called an emergency meeting of the board to then say, okay, let's look at things here. Let's put this in here, I don't agree, have a consensus and understanding and time to, to discuss. That was not done, I think it is it's almost in the form of corruption. Because how can you have us here as a body and we don't get to talk amongst ourselves about what's going out there asking someone to come here to assess us? You're not a trusting person. No, it's about, <laughs> it's about to proceed. No, I don't trust that. When you undermine the process of all of us here and you don't give the information for us to discuss I'm as gonna, a body. I, I, okay, I'm going to stop this because... So I'm, not, I'm saying, because I'm asking the question. I'm asking a very why wasn't the body convened to discuss what's going on? Because there's things that we discussed there that wasn't in there because I was told specifically by the gentleman uh, from the city well, let's saying talk, let's that talk we talk about what needed to be there. Let's Excuse talk about those things. Mr. Rancia, listen. I understand you're the chair, but we here as the body, we have well, something I, has been taking well, place. Let me, me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Can I can I have a point? Of, listen, I have I have to finish. Inside, listen, inside, inside. The, let me tell you why that was important. Inside the RFP, let me tell you why I don't have no trust. Okay. Inside the RFP, which was sent out in November 15, it stated that 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 um, uh, uh, housing part. Um, uh, the CMHA owns the Whitney. It stated that in that in that document that was sent out to people saying in November 15 that CMHA owns the Whitney. That only came about until Monday when the city council voted to forgive four million dollars that they gave to do the Whitney, but they own it to then turn it into rental or rent to own. Now that was in the RFP that went out that none of y'all saw. Now, how unfair or crooked 
or skullduggers going on that you allow that you that you represent us. You I should have said to Dawn, the, you should have said to Dawn, <laughs> the body must convene. Wait, wait, wait. Let's slow up. So First I'm all, saying, why did that happen? I'm going to listen to the to the so members of is, the advisory committee I'm and their complaints and try to address that. Yes, address okay. that reason why. There, it there's took another play. hand here. There was another hand for the advice. Well, first, you, you, you have to answer my question first. Answer my question first. Well, I'm trying, and, and no, you're not. Give him a chance. What was your question? My question, question is why, why you are interrupting me. I can't get there. Okay, my there question, my, Mr. Chair, the question is, why did that process go, and why was information put in there before all of us can see why that was put in there when it wasn't true at the time that it went out? I need to know yeah, that. I, and I don't know the answer, but go ahead. I, I, oh, I you the chair. You okay. should know. Right. Uh, I was at that meeting that you're speaking yes. to Yeah, uh, we were there. And at no time do I remember them saying that we will come back and you will vote on this. No, there we... A, I, I did not interrupt you. Mm -hmm. There was a lengthy discussion that we had as to some of the things that we thought were very important mm -hmm. that should be included. Now, I read that, was it 20 pages? 16. 16 page mm -hmm. document line by line. In fact, I gave some corrections to Don about grammatical and word, word uh, errors in there tonight. And the document left me with this impression. That's a very thorough document and it's included. I, and I went back to the notes that I took on that night. Mm -hmm. It included everything that I can remember writing down that we said were important. And on top of that, one of the things that we really stressed was that this should be a very diverse team. They went beyond that and said not only should it be diverse, but they have to make sure that they include uh, minority groups that have women or, 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 or uh, companies that are owned by women. So they, this, anybody that chooses to engage in this process, looking at this document, they want this job really bad because they are holding feet to the fire. That was my impression of this document, and I'm a very uh, a wordsmithy kind of person. Uh, so I would disagree that I, I don't see any attempt to, to cheat or to, uh, to, uh, Baron Burr, let to, me to, help to you. get anybody out of the but loop. As I think they've done exactly what was said they would do doing that meeting. But Reverend Burr, first thing you said that you went through it very detailed, and yet you couldn't remember how many pages it was. So <laughs> therefore, I'm not your memory is not important here. What I'm saying here is number one, we are a body. And you you send out something, you saying that you feel that way, but we had no time as a convened body to discuss what's in there. And I don't. And, and tell me what organization would allow that? When city council has issue that they subcommittee goes in and does or have hearings, they must come back to the body. NIAC follows the same process. Why should we be any different okay, when we don't do that? There's, there's time out. What we don't I need don't to do know. is argue. I don't know. Arguments don't resolve issues. Okay. Argument. Well, we need contribution. We don't need argument. But why did, but, why did that happen? Well, well, let me ask. Let me just ask a question. Because you're very concerned about this, and I want to address your concern. Yes, please do. What is the harm to the person responding to the RFP that you no, the, the, no What is the harm? It's that's, the that's what no, we have to no, evaluate. No, it's not the harm. It's the procedure that undermines this very body. And if you, if you do that once, you will do it other things. We are a convened body that's supposed to give advice. Suppose there's something in there that we didn't, that I may not agree with. We should have a discussion. There's always well, having a the discussion. Uh, well, mm -hmm. Okay. The chair should be answering uh, the question. Mr. Chair, I, I've, got to, I've got to say this. As part of this body, um, I don't feel undermined that it went out the way that it did. And I don't want to say that an error uh, says that we're doing something corrupt and crooked. And that, I don't, that is not the case at all. And I trust the way that it went out. I support the way that it went out. No. And that the fact that it hasn't been responded yet, uh, to say that something's corrupt. No, the, pro you know, the process, the process is getting, well, getting, well, we're getting to, We're getting to uh, the point where we have an RFP that's going to be responded to. The process is okay. I had no problem. I had every opportunity to be involved. I chose not to. That doesn't mean that I distrust the process. Well, well you and did there was last an error. meeting. There was an error. 
You were not the last I wasn't meeting. at the ma I wasn't at the last meeting, but I had that a means choice you know, to be there. Something as important as the RFP that determines the faith of this community, you choose not to be at the last meeting, and then you say that it's okay because you don't have input. Yeah. That means that you're, absolutely. you shouldn't even be on this board. No, so I, I your input is not important. We are going to. We are in the process of carving down the future. It's a process. It's a procedure. I'm not going to respond to that. Okay. I don't see that an error says that we're doing. Something corrupt and when you undermine that, the body, I, I, I trust. trust. And the one thing that I always appreciated from the very first meeting, this uh, advisory committee is just that. It's an advisory committee. We, we get to hear, have input. We get to say what we think. We get to say what the community tells us is important to them. But the decision making, there is a level of trust that we enter into this. And I'm sorry that all of us do not have that trust, but I think the majority of us do. And I appreciate uh, everything that's been done. I think it's been above board. Okay. So, and then we can move, if we can move on. Well, no, I, I, no, I, I need to answer that. Because number one, if that's if everything is above board, how is it that you can have an RFP that CMHA owns the Whitney? It's a mistake. It's in there. It's, it's a mistake. mistake. Okay, it's a mistake? So oh my gosh. That's what the mayor said when he said that we we're all one project one. It's, he it's, said it's, it's a mistake. It's now a we have passed the it's consequence of that. So it's a, what is no, it's not a common it's mistake. A comment that's, that's why we should have convened to catch oh, that. It's a common mistake. Oh, oh, I, 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 I think I think that you know what? You know I don't I don't appreciate the fact that, that everyone is it in a hurt to the It is a fact to the person who's responding that C M H A owns the witness. Why should we convene about it? Why did we? Why didn't they have a meeting? Okay, let's let's time out. Let's let's time out. I, I mean, sorry. this is not a one-on-one -on -one thing. You're upset about it. It's it, yeah. it's done. It's out there. The person responding, in fact, will respond to a fact that CMHA owns the Whitney. But, but and so that is a fact. They did not own it then. It may not yeah, have. Right. But oh, the they fact is, when they oh. respond, let they will be responding let's hear from the to public. Because obviously, the advisory board. I would is, like is, to is, have is, the. Is, well, is, wait a minute. I'm going to run the meeting. Okay. Well, okay. okay. I'm going to allow the director to to, uh, to to respond to what she's heard here in uh, this discussion. Just to two points that were raised by Mr. Brown. You asked why the RFP was not emailed out. It was not emailed out because we wanted the document to remain confidential before its official release. So we invited advisory committee members, yes, to come to our office to review the hard copy of the RFP based on our conversation that we had September 1st. That's why the document was not emailed out. We offered a week of dates for advisory members to come at their convenience, and we encourage advisory committee members to let us know if those times weren't good for you so we can make other arrangements. We also, Mr. Edney, excuse me, um, at the September 1st advisory committee meeting, we said that the release would be on November 15th. So it has always been a November 15th release date. We mentioned that at the September 1st advisory committee meeting. This body should have been aware that we were not meeting again until <coughs> December 7th. So at no time did we say we were going to reconvene. If as advisory committee members that was the wish of the body, certainly there could have been an opportunity to say we should reconvene and vote on it. That recommendation was not made. So in absence of any comment when we laid out that process, we moved forward in that way because we didn't hear any opposition. So those are the responses to your questions. Okay, thank you. That was very eloquent. I appreciate that. All right, that answers his question. We're going to move on. <laughs> Let's move on to subcommittee reports. I have, uh, in the back. Chair, I have another question pertaining to the small meetings. She, I said I had two questions. That was pertaining oh, to the RFP sorry. process. We have one about the small meetings. Community conversations. Right, community conversations. We said. <coughs> And even at the last meeting, it was stated from with uh, our current state senator and our former senator that this is a dangerous thing where you have small meetings. We're saying it's, we, there should be big meetings where people can get together or you bring all this information and then you can conversate at a, at a larger body. When you have small meetings, people come and say things, they leave with what they came there with. You, the, the opportunity for larger meetings is, is what the neighborhood needs. We have people here. 
that, 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 that could have came to those to meetings. To that. We heard your feedback at that last meeting, and that's why we're having the launch on January 8th where people mm -hmm. can give feedback. And as Autumn mentioned in her report, and about, as I've stated repeatedly, the community conversations is just the first form, and it's just one form of community engagement that will be used throughout the process. I just want to clarify for the room that we are just getting started in the planning process. So throughout that process, there will be ongoing opportunities for community engagement, and we welcome your involvement in helping to shape what that might look like and inviting stakeholders to be part of the ongoing community engagement. But that, that can't be true, Don, because one, you're making decisions and putting things in, 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 in the pipeline to be done, and you're asking people for input, and it's already down the road. What? What is down the road? Well, the RFP has been out. You're deciding. And we, we, the question that came up in the beginning about saving a section of Poindexter, that, that, yet that has not been fully discussed, we, but yet we, we are on our way with the master plan when that's not even included. That was one of the points of including to say that we're hoping you want to share this information with the master plan, that right. that would be... But that should be in the, that should be in the, in the no, RP. No, no, no. I, I, it not, in my opinion, it should not. In your opinion, it should. I think, right. I think that it's legitimate. I mean, you know, minds can differ on that issue, but you will have that opportunity to... And, and hopefully will present and your issues <coughs> with the plan. And, 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 and we're not going to deny you that. No, and, and the other issue that I brought up from the beginning of this process of going down the road with this RFP, I said that, that back in 2002, to the body and those who in, in, included, that there should have been an, an, an impact study of what is going to happen to this neighborhood when you level Point Dexter. And what have happened to the businesses that never that, that are here? I think that we're going to have some discussion about the impact studies that were done. But I, if I've been asking for a copy and I've not received one. Well, it wasn't our work to do that. I mean, you understand CMHA that, that was part as a partner. CMHA is a partner. They should have provided that. I've asked them, even with the federal acts, I requested it and still have not received one. And, and so, if you have something, I let, need to let, have let me, that. Let me make something clear. The decision as to what's going to happen to Poindexter Village <coughs> was made long before an advisory committee was formed. But so we that, have, that decision, but we have that decision is not part of our discussion. Our have, discussion is what is the community going to look like in the future. No, and I want to keep that focus. Yes, we okay, want to. If, we if want you to still look. have problems with that, you have to take that to some other body but to I'm address. Still saying, just not we all hard. want the community to look so, better. What we are saying here, there's some, there's some components of that that we need to have included in that vision. And hopefully you will present that. I, 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 am, I am counting on you to present that. To finish your research, find out the information you need to have, and present those concerns. We are relying upon you to do that. Will you, will you fulfill that? I've already presented those concerns. The CMA well, we had a meeting. Brian and I. I'm not going to debate that. Had a meeting. It's, we're it's asking to make sure that the uh, planner, uh, whoever they, that planner may be, hears from you and your specific concerns. Okay. Thank, yeah, thanks for recognizing me. Maybe it's because I'm paid to talk. I can't just sit and for a long time. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I wanted to ask a question, and then I wanted to explain is whether, you know, in all these conversations with people in the community, what kind of debate came up? What kind of dissent came up? You know, and if you can give us a sense of that, because. Um, and, and I want to give an explanation for that, just to give, give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Because um, I've been involved in different movements, I've heard and read about different movements. Lots of people talk about development and how development is going to be better, right? If we make a change, take, get, get rid of these buildings and do this and do that, and everyone uses the word community, right? Because everybody is, you know, right? That's, that, that, that's what everybody does whether they have uh, a good faith or not, right? And um, I also know Ohio State very well. And Ohio State doesn't just put $10 million into something out of goodwill. Um, in, a, in a recent town hall meeting that President Gee had for us faculty, he talked about this whole development only in terms, because he was talking about financing, he talked about it in terms of net benefit for Ohio State. Um, and, and revenue that it'll generate for Ohio State. And so because, because of the general question of how development is always talked about as being in the interest of community but isn't, and because of the particular nature of knowing my own boss, <laughs> right? Um, I have, I, I'm coming to this question of what kind of dissent, 
disagreement, questions? What were the sort of tensions that came up in those meetings? Because I can't, it wasn't, I like the cloud, but I'm sure it wasn't just, oh, yeah, you know what I mean. A, That's part of the launch. I mean, that is part of the launch. But right? let me back up and explain. The community conversations were to debate this process. So in the community conversations, we asked people, what kind of community do you want? What does your community look like today? And so people were just giving us a description. What is here now? And how did we get here? It wasn't just yesterday that there was all of this vacancy and the education was in the state that it's in, et cetera, et cetera. What are your ideas about what we can do to make it better? What can individuals do to make it better? And how do we get there? So that was the frame of the conversation. I do think that uh, there are plenty of people in this room that have participated in community conversations. A lot of the dissent or debate came around Poindexter, um, which was not a goal of the community conversation. A lot of people were also um, upset about the ODOT construction that's happening, um, the lack of investment in the community, and why did we get to the point of such disinvestment. But I think overall the community conversations, and maybe it was the order the questions were asked, they ended on a hopeful note of this is where we are now, this is how we got here, and this is where we would like to be and we left it at that. So the conversations weren't really digging at this process or why PACT was established or what the process was, but really what, what do you want to see um, and just gathering those surface beliefs. So there was some dissent, honestly, um, but it was good conversation, I think, good healthy conversation. Um, but most of it was around point extra, I think, and just the disappointment and the disinvestment of this. I'm going to call time out on this part of the discussion because sure. I, I, we want to, we're now kind of bleeding into time. I need to get uh, the uh, something to do with You ain't getting nothing done. done. I'm happy to hang out after and answer questions yeah. about the you, conversation. Not just you, every, they should, everybody should hear that. Okay, That's we have the whole a, thing. You have this to very, we have a time. You just rush people to you. You're not, you're not doing I am, that. because we have an agenda. Because we have a lot of time that I've asked these people to, to give all, to this. All your work for the institution, all y'all doing is overriding the people that's been living in this community for years. You know what? The people that's been living in this Barry, community for years haven't I, gotten a dime out of anything. And businesses are nobody. And you think the people around this table stole it from them? I mean, what do you think? I, I believe some of y'all are part of it. I don't even know. I only know half of y'all on that board. I'm, Listen. And the problem is that y'all. I'm, I'm trying to run a meeting, please. I understand. Okay, you but may you, not like the way I run a meeting. You need to stop you the meeting the way you want to. I would like to have. But y'all need to stop the reports. Okay. That's why y'all want to give reports, but y'all don't want to hear these people that's raising their hands. Job and economic impact. Excuse me. Well, I, I want you to know that one of the very first meetings that we had, um, there really weren't people for the community here. This is the man that intentionally made sure that everybody who's sitting here today is here today and any other meeting that they want to be at. He's the one responsible for that. So no that's one that's not true. No, no disrespect for no, you. And uh, you, you just moved to him. And all I'm saying to you is that you, you seem to be the spokesperson. Do Listen, I don't need to be the spokesperson. Okay. The fact that Mr. Ranzier has made sure that Listen. people from the community are present and I, I know Mr. Ranzier for years. He worked. He was on city council and he's worked a lot in doing city business, okay? So you don't have to speak for him, okay? I'm, I'm but all I'm saying to all I'm saying to you these all things have been occurring. Uh, we do not need to argue. What we need to do is come okay. together. Y'all are making this turn say into a circus here. I am just a neighborhood you know association you know person. Because but it don't need to go there. The Bring so resolutions. Years. What Mr. Bring Bring Bradley said was a valid point. Bring and what y'all do is say, y'all hold those things and close the door and make decisions for the community. You, the reason why you can't get nowhere because you undermine the community. And as long as you keep undermining the community, you're going to have a lot of uprising against what y'all doing. Because you know what? I don't see not. But I don't feel like I don't see 90% of my neighbors that I feel like I am very involved. I attend most of the meetings. I see you at this meeting, but I have not seen you at any other meetings. I go to the subcommittees. I live right on Parkwood. And I'm not afraid. I go to every single subcommittee, every single advisory. Have not seen you there, including you. But y'all are bringing chaos to this meeting. Excuse me. The whole problem is that. Y'all are the community. Y'all need to Excuse start doing it. You Barry. can get what belongs to you. That's why you won't have this kind of Barry. situation. You know what I'm saying? Y all, y all As a person that did attempt to try to go to the subcommittees, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to know how you were able to go to every subcommittee. Because I Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> when they were all scheduled some at the same time. Well, how did you possibly <laughs> 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 here? 
at one place when they had at the exact same time another subcommittee at another place. How did you manage that? Because I didn't say it all. Okay. Well then, well that, well that's not. Well then you, you're not doing what you just said. Then. Because in order to be a part of it, you need to be through the whole thing. All right. Let me just say this, and then I'm gonna sit down. Acting on the wall. In regards to you saying people did not have any problems with the subcommittee, yes we did. And one of our problems was that they were made at the same time so that people could not go. I wanted to go to all the meetings. I didn't just want to find out what was going on with this one meeting. I was not given an opportunity to do that. And that was a, a, a issue that we have had uh, about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's not that you haven't had meetings, because you have had meetings. That's not our point. Our point is this, you have deliberately set up meetings so that there were two or three meetings going on at the same time so that we, none of us, could at all know exactly what was happening. That's our only problem. With it. It's not, it's not, that's, that's, and you need to be able to I, I, hear I, I that. To make a you need, but you just need to be able to hear that. Just, just a second. Each subcommittee chair and co-chair sets their own agenda for their own subcommittee meetings. Period. She was talking about the community conversation. That's no, what I'm, I'm talking, talking about. about. And the community yeah. conversation. Exactly. Right. No, 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 but we set our own agenda and our own schedule That's for the community wrong. conversation. But it did not benefit the community if the well, people want to know what's me. going on. Excuse me. Then if that is what you wanted to know, then you could call the office to get the name of the chair of the person who handled the community conversations, but see, it's, it's on both of our parts to communicate. It's not just one side. The communication is not all, just all one we side. Want, all we want is a community is to be involved. All we want to know is when you have these meetings and you say you want our opinion, all we're asking for is to make the meetings available so that we can go. That's all we want is to just know what you're doing and know it all at once. We're not asking for much. Are you, are you well, well, I think, I think we've improved but, but communications. I, I don't think you need to, to misrepresent us for what we I'm did. talking about me as a person, no, I'm not the community. I'm, I'm talking about you too, okay? Now, the other thing is, we have the website, all the information we put on the website, we're having the launch <coughs> in January. Now, if you want to know about other meetings that other subcommittee co-chairs are having, then you can ask them. The How many of our senior citizens have commuted? Have you commuted? How many of our senior citizens that live in this area get on the internet so poor we or the email? Have. We want to know what's going on and we want you to give it to us without us having to go to the website because a lot of our people are poor and they don't have a, com a, a computer. Okay? okay. All right. And they come to go to the library and spend five years to use a computer. Just make it available so that we know what you're doing. That's all we have. There's the news. You put everything else on news bulletins. You got that channel three going. I'm just asking a question. I'm asking, but you don't have to be angry. You're right, and I apologize. Why shouldn't you be angry? Uh, yeah. 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 But don't tell yeah. senior citizens and poor people <coughs> that we're putting stuff on the web. I mean, that is a form of exclusion. Not like I said, we're not going to exclude. But that's an exclusion when you say you can go on the website. Well, we're trying to grow. I can. We are trying to grow. I can go right here on the website, but anybody can. I understand. And we're trying to broaden communication. If I may respond to, ma'am, what's your name? My name is Julie Whitney Scott. Ms. Scott, if I may respond, we have heard the feedback about the community conversations being scheduled on the same night, and we have accepted responsibility for that. We extend our apologies. <coughs> we do know that the community conversations happened over a two month period, so when they fell on the same night, it was a rare occasion versus the norm. But going forward, we have committed, because this has been a concern of Dana, we have committed to not scheduling community conversations in the future on the same night. Thank Regarding the information, we certainly recognize that everyone does not have web access. Website is just one of numerous tools we plan to use. We have ordered information centers that we will place throughout the community. And again, at the launch, we will have an information center present so people know to look for it out in the community, and we will have information available through the Information Center. Thank we you. also encourage all of you in this room, so clearly yes. you have networks and constituencies. We need your help in getting the word out about PACT and about what we're trying to accomplish and about the opportunities for community engagement. And so we invite you to be part of this work 
and to let us know at any time if there's something you think we can be doing differently or better. We welcome that feedback, and we're excited about the people who are here interested, <coughs> and we want to make sure that you stay engaged in a way that's meaningful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. As a primary source of information, <coughs> people all in the room are sitting in this table. So let's remember that too. Well, I've been doing okay. a lot. Okay. Let's remember that these they're committed to be the ambassadors and to get the word out. They're willing to do so. That you know, I mean won't you give some money for some flyers? Keep going. Okay. Fred, we're gonna pass on jobs and economic impact. There isn't anything to add besides what's in this. Okay. No economic? Uh Al is not report. here. Can you oh, oh there he is. Okay. No with it. No with it. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. Thank you. This is Al Edmondson. Uh, he was not introduced before, but also a member of our advisory committee. And Al and I are co-chairs of the Safe, uh, Vibrant, and Accessible Community Subcommittee. And we've been meeting for the last few months uh, looking at the issues of safety and uh, accessibility. And we've invited guests to come in to talk to us and give us information about uh, the crime rate uh, in the area, and also we talked about uh, cameras uh, in the neighborhood when it comes to safety. We have exhausted conversation. Uh, we spend a lot of our meetings on safety because we know it is of uh, important concern to you all. And we also have been talking about accessibility. Not just accessibility from a transportation issue, but accessibility to jobs, accessibility to, to health care, accessibility to education. So we've looked at it from a, from a holistic standpoint, and we continue to do so. Our next conversation is going to be on vibrancy. What makes the neighborhood vibrant? That's our next meeting. And we're holding that meeting. Our meetings are scheduled the fourth Tuesday of every month. Now, to be aware, we don't have a set place. We do have a set date and date, but we don't have a set place of when the meeting is going to occur. If you want uh, to know when that is, you're certainly welcome to attend. Uh, give Autumn a call, give myself a call, and then we'll certainly make you aware of the barbershop, too. And on the website, there's a section, like Don mentioned, called the meeting room with all the subcommittee dates, times, and locations that we get them. Absolutely. But feel free to call, too. Going forward, what we hope to do is to break out into subgroups, to delve deeper into those subject matters, and the outcome of that are going to be recommendations to be made to the advisory committee and to be included in the, uh, the study. So we're gonna look at it hard. And uh, those so subgroups, you're certainly welcome to participate, add your, uh, add value by coming and talking. And um, no host bar, we wanna hear you. And uh, we'll take the time to listen to you. So uh, open invitation at any time, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share with folks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we next have uh, health and wellness. So Tim and Kim are here. I, I, I want to um, uh, enrollment. People aren't enrolling in the schools because they're hearing a lot of negative things about what's happening in the school, and that's you know that's one part of the story. There are a whole host of other um, things that are going on, particularly in the middle school with Champion. Um, there's a significant amount of investment. They have great leadership. They have great teachers. And so it was an opportunity for our subcommittee to begin to learn and understand that. Um, we also visited some of our um, uh, private schools within the catchment, um, Mansion Day School, as well as um, St. Charles Preparatory Academy. And you know those are great assets to the community. Children in the neighborhood may not be able to access it, but there are resources for their resources that we could begin to leverage because they have um, resources, whether they be libraries, recreational facilities. Um, they may also be able to provide summer programming so that we aren't able to we don't experience gaps in learning. So young people come out of school in the summer. They're, you know, if they don't stay engaged with reading and all the other disciplines, they may fall back. <coughs> so those are great resources that we could begin to think of how, how do we tap those to support the educational outcomes of the children in the neighborhood. Um, so those tours, I think, have given us a really strong qualitative view of what's going on. Now, you know, we want to balance that with quantitatively what's going on and make some sense of of all of that information to s d develop a set of recommendations. And our co-chair, my co-chair, Mark Real, 
um, will be joined with a new co-chair, and they'll be leading the subcommittee um, in the development of those recommendations. Um, we do. We meet on Tuesdays. Um, the next meeting is on um, is on December 13th, where we'll be talking in more detail about what we learned from the tours. So we're of course, you know, we'll be meeting here, right, Autumn? Mm -hmm. We'll be he meeting here at 4:30, 4:30, <laughs> um, and that's it's you know, and we're definitely open to having folks kind of observe um, the meeting, participate in the meeting. Um, we also will be meeting in January. Um, at Columbus State because we know that's a great asset in the neighborhood that people can begin to access as well in terms of education. So that's what's been going on. I'm, I want to just personally say that this experience has been tremendous. Um, I want to personally thank Mr. Rancier, Don Tyler Lee, um, Autumn Williams um, for really entrusting me with this role as a subcommittee <coughs> chair. I've learned a great deal about um, this community that I've grown to love. Um, and I just look forward to hearing great things. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any chance for question? You want to <coughs> I'm trying to get the reports out because we're run, our time is, is getting short here. Uh, Lila? Okay. I will, I will make mine short. Uh, my name is Lila Boyk and I co-chair the housing subcommittee. I'm happy to say that uh, housing uh, very successfully held six community conversations and in a couple of those we had some dissension and some tension and some, some negative things that came out that we are addressing. Um, I also want you to know that resounding coming out of the community conversations is that the biggest concern is with the vacant properties in the targeted area. Well, I have a vested interest in that, too, because I live right smack dab in the middle of the target area. So I'm spending a lot of time trying to find out what we can do to resolve that. Uh, on November 15th, I met with the city attorney's office to review the city legislation regarding what they're able to do with um, property owners of, of vacant and abandoned housing, uh, things that they would like to see done. They've made some recommendations uh, to me about some things that we can do at the neighborhood level to begin to help to push uh, this process a little bit. Uh, you probably heard me um, request to meet with uh, Mr. Turner from uh, the City Land Bank and Mr. Leonard from the County Land Bank. I think we need to all come together and begin to talk about strategies of how we can begin to relieve our neighborhood of vacant and blighted properties that have a negative impact <coughs> on those who are currently living here. That's the goal of the housing subcommittee because people have said it affects the safety, it affects the children, it affects whether or not businesses will come into the neighborhood, all of that. So <coughs> primarily if we want to improve the quality of life of this targeted area then housing and I think we're all on the continuum has to, we just have to roll with it so housing will be spending a lot of time trying to help resolve this problem of, of, of blighted housing the housing subcommittee meets the second Tuesday of every month at 4 p.m. at Union Grove Baptist Church and it's 266 North Champion. Except for this Tuesday. Except for this to Tuesday. Tour at 3:30. Yes. So. And for those of you who might be interested, housing is having a a tour of the housing in the targeted area. That's on the 13th, and I believe we meet in the parking lot here at 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And please call the office and let them know if you want to participate on the tour because we have to make sure we've got enough transportation for everybody. But if you're really concerned about housing in this area and you want to see some positive things happen, uh, then we'd like for you to at least join us on that tour and to talk to us because you may say something that will trigger us in terms of developing a strategy for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, while not on the agenda, I think uh, because of the conversation, Brian, if you could just give us an update on what's taking place. Sure.
first, uh, let me just cover two non-point expert issues. Can you speak up, please? Real quick. Um, 